Good morning. If everybody can find a seat, we will get started this morning. with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with garments, 
stretching out the heavens like a tent. He set the earth on its foundations, so it should never be moved. The mountains arose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You caused the grass to grow for the livestock and the plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden, it, to gladden the heart of men, oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's heart. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth. Let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Now we'll, we'll stand and sing, How Great Thou Art.
Please be seated. And we'll go to the Lord in prayer today with our congregational prayer. Dear Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that we can be here to worship you this morning out in your nature, out, out at the lake, Lord. We just thank you for this. We thank you that you provided for us. And we ask, Lord, that you would heal those in our church and our community that need healing. We pray for Melissa. We pray for Dale. And Lord, we ask that you would comfort the Koopman family. Lord, we, we thank you for, for the life that you give us. And we ask that, that each day that we would consider what you would have us do, because it is not our life, Lord, but your life that you have given us to live for you. Lord, we pray for the community in which we live. We pray for the people that are in government, for those that are in the local government, the state government, and even in our federal government, Lord. We pray that you would be working through them, whether or not they follow you. That, Lord, that you would be working in the hearts of those that are around us. And, Lord, that you would bring revival to this land. That you would bring repentance, Lord. We ask that, that we would be part of that. We pray for those in our community that, that don't have a place to sleep, that don't have enough food to eat. We ask that, that Lord, that you would put the right people in the right place at the right time to be able to serve the community. Lord, we, we pray for those families, those mothers that are considering abortion for their children, that, Lord, that you would just change their minds, that you would bring somebody alongside them that would, that would share your love with them. Lord, we, we pray that in this community, that you, Lord, would give us the desire, you give us the desire to serve this community as you want us to serve it. That would not be our desires and, and our comforts and what we want, but, Lord, what you want, that we may be your hands and your feet to the people around us. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you'll stand, we'll be singing This Is My Father's World. And while this isn't outside today, we're still out in, in God's world. And we can see this lake out here, the beauty that, that God has created for us. So let's stand and sing This Is My Father's World.
faith with believers throughout the uh, Reformed churches, with the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 1, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And together, that I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He watches watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation, because I belong to him. Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. study your word this morning, and may these words be clear, understandable, and useful for our growth. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So many of us grew up in a community that was more similar to the Jewish community that Jesus lived in than different than the community. Yes, it's true that we have met many modern appliances. Things that Jesus and his disciples never had. And it's true that we live in the land of the free and the, and the home of the brave is while Jesus suffered <coughs> under the Roman rule. <clears throat> and yes, it's true that our cultures are different in many ways. However, I grew up in a community. A community in a time where people knew the name of Jesus. They knew who the Christian God was. That's not necessarily the case today. Jesus and his disciples, they grew up in a community where a majority of the people also knew who God was or who God is and what he required of them. I grew up in a place and a time where we had an abundance of pharisaical leaders with laws that need to be followed in order not to break the laws that were actually biblical commands of God. These are the same type of leaders that ran the religious community in which Jesus and his disciples lived and created an unreasonable number of non-biblical laws with which to go, the Jews. It was this community in which John the Baptist was born into and as, as uh, Mark in the Gospel that bears his name wrote, how John the Baptist quoted the words of the prophet Isaiah, Behold, I will send my messenger before your face 
who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight his paths. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And John looked forward to someone greater than he, someone who would baptize with the Holy Spirit. John baptized Jesus just prior to his temptation in the wilderness. And it's at this point, before Jesus calls the disciples, that we read the scripture passage for today. It's Mark 1, 14 to 15. And it's in your bulletins. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to, into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. John had been arrested. And while God was merciful and allowed him to see Jesus' ministry from prison, until the day that, that the Father had appointed his life to end, here on earth, and for him to go to heaven, Jesus, his ministry was just beginning. And, and at the beginning of his ministry, he had three things that he proclaimed. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. This is the time of the, that was prophesied of old, that the becoming of a Messiah. Back in the, in the Old Testament, in, in many places, starting back in Genesis 3.15, when in the garden, Adam and Eve had sinned against God. And God prophesied that he would be sending somebody. He'd be sending somebody who, who would come and save them. This was but the first prophecy about the coming of Jesus through the words of the prophets. And God keeps pointing forward to the time in which, which his prophecy would be fulfilled. We read in Galatians 4, 5-6 through the Apostle Paul, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might have adoption as sons. You see, it was the beginning of the time. God had set this, this time, this date, for the coming of the Messiah, the Savior of his people. And when I say Savior of his people, it's not just the Israelites. It's all that believe in God. We are included in his people. And this is what, why Jesus proclaimed, the time is fulfilled and the coming of the, the kingdom of God is at hand. But Jesus didn't stop there. He proclaimed the need for each person, each person hearing his voice, to also repent. So why do we need to repent? Because I'm a pretty good person. I, I do more good than I do bad. I've never murdered anybody. I live better than most people. You know, I'm, I'm not like Hitler, or that, or that person three campsites down from me. No, I'm not like them. I'm better than that. They, they really need Jesus. But, but me, I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm tolerant. I don't bother anybody. I follow the law all the time. Well, at least the laws I believe are right. Because, you know, speeding, that's not a just law. You shouldn't have to follow that one. I get along with most people, or at least most of the time. When God created Adam and Eve, God created a covenant with Adam and Eve. And that was the covenant of works. And through Adam and Eve, he created also with all of us. And so that means that we can have a relationship with God. But we can only have a relationship with God as long as we obey him perfectly. And so do we obey him perfectly? Do we obey God's law perfectly? Do we do everything that God expects from us? And so let's just pick out ten laws from the Old Testament, and you've heard these many times, I am sure. To have no other gods before God. You are not to make an idol. You have to make for yourself an idol, or worship anything that is not God. You are not to take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You are to remember the Sabbath, to keep it holy. You are to honor your father and your mother. You are not to murder or to sin in your anger. You are not to, to commit adultery or to lust after anyone. You are not to steal or take anything that doesn't belong to you. You are not to bear false witness or lie. You are not to covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. So do you obey those laws perfectly? Have you ever valued something more than you value God? 
Every church has their sacred cows. Things that are not in the scripture, but people in church believe are, are more important, are more valued than anything. For some, it involves comfort. Don't make me uncomfortable. I won't talk to anybody about Jesus because I'm not comfortable doing that. And I shouldn't move around with the uh, hand that has the mic. I'll work on that. Uh, for others, they involve ideas of how things should be done. You know, we've never done it that way before. It, we've got to follow tradition exactly the way it's always been. For others, it's, it's the music that's been elevated to, to idol worship. The music styles, you know, for example, we have to sing the latest and greatest, or we need to have the drums in the church, or we can't sing anything I didn't sing when I was younger. All of these things have become more important. Or for others, it's money. This is something that people often fight about, whether in marriages or in churches or, or throughout anywhere. For some, it's going to fancy restaurants that they can't afford. For others, it might be a car or a boat that they value more than, than being in church on Sunday. Or how about honoring your father and mother? Have you always perfectly honored your father and mother? And so children, as children, this involves obeying your father and mother. Do you always obey your father and mother? When they ask you to pick up your toys, do you pick up those toys? Do you clean them up? Or do you whine and complain? When they ask you to eat your vegetables, or to tell you you've had enough dessert, no more cookies, or that it's time to go to bed, do you obey your parents? For some of you who are a little bit older like me, and you're probably a normal teenager, you may have said some things to your parents that now you regret having said. There was a time that you, you didn't think they really understood what the real world was like. And yet they, they probably understood more than we give them credit for. And we could go through the rest of these Ten Commandments. And if you still believe that you've never sinned, then, then you're not thinking very carefully. Because all of us have sinned. You know, and the older we are, the, probably the easier some of these sins come to mind. Isaiah 53, 6 teaches that all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Or we can turn to Romans 3, 23, which teaches, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. We're all sinners. And it's this sin that Jesus calls us to repent from. When Jesus called us to repent, what is he calling you to do? Repentance, the Greek word for this is matineo, mat, matineoio. It's, it's Greek words and it comes with uh, meta, which means with or after, and neoio, neoio. It's, yeah, interesting to pronounce, but uh, it means to perceive, to understand, as a result of, of uh, pers uh, perceiving or observing. And so it, it adds together this thing of time and change and after and different. So to think different after. And so really when you boil all that together, what repentance really means is that your thoughts after repentance are different from your thoughts before repentance. So before repentance, you may think that something is okay. After you realize that this is not in the, wills of, in the will of God and it's something you should not do and cannot do. Um, repentance is often thought about as just sorrow, being sorry for your sins. But there's a Greek word that's, that, that means that. It's not the word that's used here. This is a different Greek word. It means changing your thoughts to change the results in a change in behavior, which results in a change in behavior. So, for example, there was a time when, when I was in college. And the college I was in had a, well, room not much different than this. There was classrooms on either side, but it kind of a gathering room with tables. And so I used to sit down and I, and I would talk to people. Um, and I had some people, I, I'd see them around, but I'd never really met them, but they were sitting there. And one of them was talking about he, how he'd gotten his, his girlfriend pregnant. And he was, he was weighing the options and, and he was, you know, was going to send her for an abortion. And I knew that God had, was, was pricking me to say something and I never said anything. I, I, was, I didn't know them well enough. They were more part of the cool group. You know, I was part of more of the, 
the group that was actually there to study and learn something, they were there just because they were told they had to be there. And so I never said anything. But on the way home, God really convicted me for not speaking up for that child. And I had been, it's not that I didn't know what was right. It's not that I hadn't walked in the, in the, uh, the walks of Chicago that, that we, we raised money for the, for the pregnancy centers. It's not that I didn't know any of that. But I didn't have the courage to speak up. And so on the way home, I repented of my silence, and I vowed never to be silent again. That when God prompts me to speak up, especially in an area of sin, that no matter what it would cost me personally, I will speak up. And it included prayers for forgiveness, it included prayers for the student, his girlfriend, and the baby. And just as important, it changed my mind and the way I thought about it, and the future actions I would have. And so this wasn't the last time I needed to repent, but thankfully, God forgives us when we repent of our sins. And so the next part of this, we have, we have to repent, but that's only half of it. We also have the need to, to repent and then believe, to turn from our need to the gospel, to believe in the gospel. So repenting is, is necessary, but the repenting is, will not save us. We must believe in the gospel. The gospel is not just head knowledge. If we read in James 2.19, you believe that God is one, you do well, but even the demons believe and shudder. The head knowledge of belief, all of us here I'm sure believe that there's a God. They believe, we believe that God is, is in charge of all things, but that belief is not enough to be saved. Belief in this context is to have faith or trust in God. In God's true word, that the, that the Bible, the scripture is true. It, it goes beyond just a, just a head knowledge. It has to be in the heart. For New Testament Christians, to believe something is, well, for New, the New Testament era Christians, so back, back early Christians, to believe is, is to have faith. It meant to, to be persuaded, convinced of the truth. They knew that this truth is true with all they, with all they were, and it changed their lives. You know, a good synonym for faith is not to, to hope or wish. I have faith that, that the Bears will win this weekend. Well, we're next time I play Green Bay anyway. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Or I have, that's, that's a hope and a faith, but you know what? I've seen the Green Bay play and I've seen the Bears play this year, and that hope, that, that faith is not a very strong faith. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but that is not what it means. Per, the faith here is, is persuaded, convicted, knowing. You know, it's not about something that might or might not happen. It's about the fact that we know it will happen. And so, here's an illustration, and, and you may have heard this before. But there's a, there's a great illustration of a man that... So, back, have, have any of you guys been to Niagara Falls? Okay. Long way across. I've actually never made that trip. I've seen pictures, it's great. But this, this guy put a rope across Niagara Falls. And he was gonna walk across. And so, he had a group of people gathered there that's gonna watch this, and he, he kind of rallies them up and, said, and, and you know, said, come on, watch me walk across. You know, nothing more than this little rope. And so people are watching this, he's like, one, one slip and I will tumble to my death. You never know when I might fall. The rope is getting wet from the water, the wind's coming up, I don't want to die, but today could be the day. And so the crowd is, is just cheering him on, and, 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 and who can believe I cross? And everybody raises their hand, and so he does, he, he walks across, he, you know, he staples himself with his hands, walks across, and everything's great. He comes back, and he said, you know, that was far too easy. No challenge at all. How many of you guys think I can do it with this wheelbarrow over here? He takes this wheelbarrow out. And everybody says, yeah, that sounds great. You can, I think you can do it. And he goes through that same type of, you know, rallying the crowd up. And he does it. He crosses. He comes back with the wheelbarrow. And he, he stumbles a couple times. It does it pretty well, but he makes it. Comes back. And then he says, well, who believes I can do it again with somebody inside the wheelbarrow? And the majority of the people raise their hand. Not everybody, but a, but a majority of the people. And he's like, yeah, yeah, this is great. You know, he's like, okay, 
Who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? Nobody raised their hand. <laughs> Nobody wants to get in that wheelbarrow. There are no takers, and the, and the crowd is, they never get to see him cross with somebody in the wheelbarrow. You see, that's faith. Faith is the person that would get in that wheelbarrow who would say, yes, I know you can cross. I'm going to put my life on the line because I know you can cross. Is that the faith that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? When our loved one is sick or incapacitated, do you still believe that God is in control? When there is a conflict in your place of business, do you trust God with the results? When, when someone intentionally maligns your name, do you let God fight for you or do you stoop to his or her level? Are you willing to lose something important to you to speak the truth of God's word? When somebody you care about dies unexpectedly, do you turn to God for comfort or do you lash out at God? When you feel alone, do you turn to God or do you reach out for a bottle? This doesn't mean you'll never doubt or you'll never have a bad day. Some of the greatest prophets in the Bible got depressed and down after their spiritual battles. In 1 Kings 19.4, we read about Elijah after his great victory over the prophets of Baal. He, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Or when God was merciful for the Ninevites after Jonah's spiritual battle. In Jonah 4.3, Jonah told God, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better to die than to live. Or in verse 9, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Or according to God's word, Job, who did not sin amidst his trials, said, Why did I not die at birth, or come out of the womb and expire? I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. I loathe my life. I will give free repentance to, to my complaint. I will speak to the bitterness of my soul. Terrors are turned upon me. My honor is pursued as by the wind. My prosperity has passed like a cloud. And now my soul is poured out within me. The days of my affliction have taken care of me. The nights of my bones, the pain that gnaws at me. Even Jesus told his disciples that his soul was deeply grieved to the point of death in Mark 14, 34. And Luke records that Jesus, dropped, Jesus sweat drops of blood. Yet if we believe God's words in Psalm 34, we learn that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed spirit. So today, we have learned the kingdom of God is at hand. We are in the last days. Each of us have sinned and eternal and, and spent and we deserve eternity in hell separated from God. Each of us will spend eternity in hell unless we repent and believe the gospel. Do you, ha do you have unrepented sin in your life? If you do, now is the time to repent. Do not wait to because you do not know what tomorrow holds. You do not even know if you have a tomorrow. You don't even know if you'll have it this afternoon. You can walk out of here and get hit by an RV driving by. We don't know how long we have. We must repent and believe. The gospel message we looked at today, the gospel message that we are told to believe in is that we are a sinner. But God loves us. And he desires a relationship with us. But God is a holy God. And a holy God cannot tolerate any sin. But God sent his son to live a perfect life, a sinless life, to follow all the laws that God required, and to die on the cross, to pay for your sins as a free gift for all who accept it. We must repent of our sins, which is a change in thinking, and believe in the gospel message in order to become children of God and spend eternity in a relationship with him. If you have any questions about that, come talk to me after service. And we'll talk about how you can know God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, your love is amazing. You loved us while we were still sinners and made a way that, that we could know you. 
You made a way that we could be forgiven from our sins. And we know that no sin is too great that it cannot be forgiven. Lord, as we say of your mercy and your grace this morning, we ask that you would lead us closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we will sing Amazing Grace.